This is a picture of a man named Phineas G. Wright, sitting on his grave monument back in 1903. And this is me, standing in front of that very same monument 120 years later. It's pretty cool to see in person, right? Now, what I want you to do here is take another look at that pic from 1903 and compare it to how the headstone looks today. Because there's actually a pretty big difference between the headstone then and now that <laughs> kind of has a real funny story behind it. So, can you spot the difference? Don't worry too much if you can't see it right away. I'll clue you in on the answer later in this video. But before I do, I feel like I kind of got to warm you up a bit first, you know, let you in on a few of the other secrets that this headstone holds as a sort of opening act for the main event. See, the Phineas Wright Stone here in Putnam, Connecticut is an absolute gold mine for those interested in the oddities of history. It is just bursting at the seams with funny little anecdotes. So let's talk about a few of them. All right, so I kind of feel like I have to start with the headstone's inscription, since that was what first made the monument famous back when it was built in 1903. So if you look real close here underneath the bust of Phineas, it says going, but no not where. Just kind of a pithy little way for Phineas to express how he really wasn't sure about what was going to happen to him after he died. Now, I know that phrase might not seem all that novel or exciting today, but let me tell you, back in 1903, people went crazy for that inscription. Like, newspapers at the time absolutely ate this up. All across the country, they were running stories on this stone. Places as far away as Georgia or California were publishing articles on the Phineas Wright grave. Some papers even sent reporters to Putnam in person to come take a look at the monument and interview Phineas. So, I thought it would be kind of fun to use one of those first-hand articles as like our base for this story. You know, kind of let the tale of Phineas Wright unfold through conversation that a reporter had with the man himself. <laughs> and then I'll just kind of jump in there here and there to supplement the story with some stuff that I found from other sources too. So let me walk you through what happened when a reporter from the Bridgeport Herald came to see Phineas Wright right away. When our reporter arrives in Putnam, he wants to go and talk to Phineas, so he asks a little boy running around where Phineas Wright lives, and the boy just kind of looks at him funny. Do you mean guard Wright, he says? Well, he just lives down the street a little bit. <laughs> See, Phineas's middle name was Gardner, and so pretty much everyone in the town called him Guard as a nickname. In basically all the citations I'm going to put on the screen here, he's going to be called Guard, not Phineas. <laughs> So, our reporter, he walks on down the road and finds Phineas sitting on a neighbor's porch. He tells him that he's here to see the monument, and that was pretty much all it took to get Guard all excited. Phineas immediately jumps up out of his seat and offers to give the reporter a ride over to the cemetery. By all accounts, Phineas was super proud of his stone, and he just loved to show it off. So he wasn't going to miss this opportunity. On the way over to the graveyard, the pair stopped at Phineas's house for a second so that he could show the reporter the absolutely colossal stack of letters that he had received since erecting the monument. Apparently, a whole lot of people had taken issue with the uh, agnostic nature of his grave's inscription and had decided to send him some messages to convince him to see their way of thinking. He was getting all sorts of letters from people telling him that he was going to go to hell and calling him a degenerate and an infidel and trying to convince him that their version of the afterlife was the correct one, but... Phineas, he just really didn't care about all that. He wasn't going to budge on his inscription. It really meant a lot to him. As he put it, he was just being honest. Them's true words, he used to say. But there ain't many folks that's got the honesty or the courage to say the same thing. As the cart rolled into the cemetery, Phineas started pointing out all the graves of his family members and began to talk a little bit about his backstory, you know, just give out a few tidbits here and there about his early life. Like, for example, he came to Putnam with his family when he was two, and he grew up without a lot of money. His dad died in 1849 chasing the California gold rush. His mom died a few years later, and the bottom line is that Phineas is 
pretty much all alone nowadays. He's the only one in his family not buried beneath the earth. Interestingly, Phineas also liked to occasionally talk about his history with love. Sometimes reporters would ask him uh, why he wasn't married, and Phineas would just kind of shrug and tell them that his heart was broken by a woman 40 years ago, and he just still hasn't recovered. He was in love once, but it didn't work out, and now he's resigned himself to living mostly alone for the rest of his life. After passing the graves of the Wright family, the cart rolled up and stopped in front of a kind of weird looking grave marker. It was an obelisk type monument that was snapped in half with a sign sticking out of the top that said this monument for sale by P.G. Wright. And what that monument was, was Phineas's first attempt at commissioning a headstone. Yeah, his famous one here with the bust on it uh, wasn't even the only one he had made. First, he had tried out this obelisk style, but ultimately decided that he didn't like it. But hey, you want to know something real wild? This actually isn't Phineas's second stone. It's his third one. <laughs> yeah, he actually had one more monument made before this one. His second monument looked pretty much just like this, except for one difference. Instead of going but no not where, it said, never beat by man, but by woman, which was supposed to be a reference to the woman that broke his heart 40 years ago. See, Phineas was very insistent that no man had ever got the better of him, but that woman who broke his heart, she got to him. Oh, and uh, by the way, if you're wondering why Phineas had that second monument replaced too, it's because <laughs> he changed the way that he wore his beard and he wanted the bust remade to reflect that. <laughs> yeah, he spent hundreds of dollars to remake an entire monument just because he was styling his beard differently. <laughs> So, he ended up sitting down at the stone cutters for four straight days and had the rock cut to a perfect resemblance, beard and all. And he loved this new stone, so much that he had it sit in front of his front lawn for a while before he moved it down to the cemetery. And now here it is today, in all its glory. <laughs> but you know, this monument isn't the only thing that's interesting about this gravesite. No, the actual grave itself that I'm standing on, like right here, has an interesting and unique story to it too. See, when Phineas took the reporter up to the grave site, he pointed out a gas pipe that he had sticking out of the ground in front of the headstone. That gas pipe was supposed to be a marker that the grave diggers could use to find and uncover the tomb that Phineas had built for himself. See, Phineas had <laughs> some very particular specifications for how he would be buried, and he wanted to make sure that those would be followed. Like, first off, he didn't like the idea of being buried in a cramped up tiny little grave. That felt suffocating to him. So what he did was have a massive hole dug into the ground and then completely lined with brick so that no dirt could get inside. So yeah, just about like six feet underneath me here is a big brick like square with a whole bunch of open air inside it that Phineas Wright is now resting inside of. But that is not even the best part. See, Phineas was really, really concerned about how his friends would feel on the day of his funeral. He really, really did not want them to be sad. So he did two things to make sure that everybody would have a good time while they buried Phineas Wright. First, he hired a local brass band to come on down and play a whole bunch of music for everybody. And second, <laughs> he secretly hid a whole bunch of liquor inside of his tomb. <laughs> he wanted to make sure that the grave diggers would find ample refreshments to relieve them after their labors. <laughs> yeah, so, so when the day of his burial came and the grave diggers popped open the tomb, it's, hey, hey look at that, o old guard left us a whole bunch of drinks and cigars and isn't this just so awesome? He wanted us to have a little party party out here and <laughs> it's just great to think about isn't it <laughs> so the pipe was there to make sure that the grave diggers would actually dig in the right spot to find the liquor <laughs> although i did read that phineas eventually got rid of that pipe because he was afraid that people would think that it was supposed to be a breathing tube and that he was trying to breathe from down in his tomb so instead he had the pipe replaced with a flagpole and a banner
But hey, I think we've had just about enough time with the opening acts. It's time to reveal that difference that I talked about at the top of the video. So uh, let's pull up those comparison pictures again. Do you see it this time? If not, let me help you out a little. You see it now? The beard in the old photo is parted, but nowadays the bust has a full beard with no part. At some point, the beard on the statue was changed. And there's actually a very funny reason behind that change. Remember how Phineas got rid of his second monument because he didn't like the way the beard looked? Well, he actually had a very similar issue with the third monument too. The sculptor had styled Phineas's beard with a really deep part in it, which was a style that Phineas himself never wore. Occasionally he would have a part, but nothing ever that deep. And it bothered him that that's how it was portrayed on the stone. See, I read a ton of interviews where Phineas was just going crazy about this. He told all these reporters that everything is awesome with the new monument, except for the beard. Like, he tells one reporter that the parted beard looks like cow teats, and he tells another that the beard makes him look like a DD, which was Phineas's way of saying, damn dude. <laughs> but although he didn't like it that much, Phineas decided that he was ultimately just going to have to live with the messed up beard. You know, he'd already had the monument remade three times and it wasn't that big a deal anyway and he was just going to let it be. Until <laughs> one day in 1907 when he had a dream that you can't get into heaven if your beard is parted down the middle. <laughs> so immediately he rushed out and paid a sculptor $400 to come in here and redo the beard without a part. Like, isn't that just great? <laughs> but okay, before we go, before I wrap up this video, I feel like I gotta tell you one last story about Phineas Wright. A bit of a touching story in its own way. See, uh, after Phineas had this monument put up, he just kept on living for quite a while. He didn't die until 1918 at the age of 89, a, a real long life. And he didn't really get up to too much during the last decade and a half of his existence on this earth, but by all accounts, he stayed in good shape right up until the day he died. You know, he went into town on his own every day. Uh, he got hit by a falling tree at the age of 80 and pulled through without too many lasting effects. Apparently, he loved to walk around everywhere barefoot. And when the town census came around asking him what he did for a living so that they could write it down in the town directory, he told them that he had no business but to mind his own. <laughs> but among all these kind of funny little anecdotes, Phineas also did one more thing. Something that I feel like I kind of got to show you in person. So let's take a little trip. This is the Woodstock Central Cemetery in Woodstock, Connecticut, just a few miles away from Putnam. And this is the grave marker for a woman named Sarah Gage. Sarah here died without a penny to her name, homeless and completely on her own her husband having died years before she did, which kind of begs the question as to how she has such a nice headstone, right? I mean, most people who died without any money back in the day, they ended up buried under an unmarked field stone or without any kind of burial marker at all. So how did Sarah get this one? Well, the reason that Sarah here has this headstone is because Phineas Wright <laughs> loved her 40 years ago. Yeah, if you look real close at the bottom of the headstone here, you can see an inscription that says, Erected by P.G. Wright. Phineas and Sarah, they, they grew up together, they went to school together, they played together, and eventually they fell in love together. She was the prettiest girl in Woodstock, Phineas used to say. But unfortunately, some kind of mysterious circumstance beyond their control drove them apart and broke Phineas's heart. And that was just kind of the end of their story together. Until when Sarah was 70 years old, her husband passed away. And with no money, crippling disability, and a mind that was starting to slip away from her in her old age, Sarah ended up homeless on the streets. Which is when Phineas heard tell that his former friend and partner 
was stuck out in the cold. I guess he just couldn't bear the thought of her being out in the world alone, so he invited her to live with him and she accepted. Years after being separated, Phineas and Sarah lived out their golden years together. After more than four decades apart, they found each other again, both over 70 years old and alone in the world save for each other. Like At that point, Sarah, she really couldn't remember much and she could hardly move without grimacing and her and Phineas didn't get married or anything, but none of that really mattered. Like At the end of the day, Phineas was just happy to see her again, e even if she only lived for another year or so after he took her in. <laughs> I, I don't know, Sarah. I'm just real glad to know that you and Guard got some closure. I hope it meant something to you. And it, as the cart pulled back up to Phineas's house after the day at the cemetery, the reporter remarked on the deeply creased but undeniably sweet face that peeked out of the dining room window. It was the tender heart of the iron-willed man. The face of Sarah Gage, the companion of Guard Wright's declining years. <laughs> Thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time.